Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy if this is your first time. I'm glad you could join us this week. So this week we have a 62-year-old male who's presenting to the clinic feeling tired and nauseous. And he's had a few episodes of vomiting. Here we have his EKG that he presented with. Okay, and then what I want you to do now is pause the video and try to go through this uh, yourself. Okay, try to answer some of these things that we have on the right side of the screen. When you're ready, restart the video. It will walk through this EKG together. So hopefully you had a chance to go through this yourself. Here we have a 62 year old male presenting feeling tired and nauseous. Okay, with this EKG. So the first thing we wanna do is look at the regularity of this rhythm. Okay, so is this a regular or irregular rhythm is what we wanna answer first. Okay, so one of the best ways is by looking for a lead that has those tall R waves or big complexes that we can know we're getting consistent intervals throughout. So if you look down here, we have lead B5, one of our uh, rhythm strips, and here's the R wave, okay? Here's the next R wave that follows it. And from one R wave to the next, we call that the R to R interval. So from this to the next one, that's another R to R interval, another one, so forth. And as you can see, these are different R to R intervals. Notice that throughout, none of them, at least most of them, are not the same, meaning this is an irregular rhythm. Not only is it irregular, but there is no regularity to this rhythm whatsoever. Because of that, we call this an irregularly irregular rhythm. Okay, so irregularly irregular. Now that we found the regularity, we can now find the rate, okay? And we do that first because this gives us a way of how we can find the rate. When we're dealing with an irregular rhythm, there tends to be one good way that we can use, all right? And we have to know that from beginning all the way to the end, remember, represents 10 seconds, okay? So those standard 12 lead EKGs that we're looking at here are 10 seconds in duration. And we know that 10 seconds times six is 60 seconds which is one minute, okay? And what that means is if you count the complexes going across, multiplied by six, you can get the rate in beats per minute. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's use the ventricular complexes here in V5. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, so there's 20 complexes here. So we would do 20 times six and that's 120. So an average rate of about 120 beats per minute. All right, and that's the ventricular rate that we found there. If you wanted to find the atrial rate, you'd have to find P waves and then count those out. You can also use T waves to find the ventricular rate. So the ventricular rate that we found was 120 the machine actually gives us 116. So the machine's output here is 116 beats per minute. All right, so we're pretty close actually. So we have an irregularly irregular rhythm, uh, the regularity with at a rate of around 120 beats per minute. Now, where's the rhythm actually coming from? So the next portion is rhythm origin. Now the rhythm origin, what we have to note here is that the QRS complexes, notice that we have them here and they're somewhat wide, okay? Remember, normal QRS duration is less than 120 milliseconds, actually between 70 and 110 milliseconds. And if you look here, the actual duration is a little wide. It actually comes out to 136 milliseconds, all right? So there may be some delay, some conduction delay within the ventricles. Another thing to note is that not only is that, we can't, we have an irregular rhythm and there's no P waves that are preceding that, okay? So no clear P waves that are coming before our QRS complexes, okay? So all these things here that you see at the end, these are the T waves, okay? Because if you look at a lead above and below, these are T waves, okay? Same thing here. So we don't actually have P waves. So an irregularly irregular rhythm at 120 or 116 beats per minute and no P waves, okay? But we do have consistent conduction throughout, okay? So we know that our rhythm is coming either from our atria or AV junction, 
okay? Or even the ventricles, because we said it was somewhat wide. Now, the reason that it's likely not coming through there is because we have an irregularly irregular rhythm. And this is one we'll get to shortly, and that means that the rhythm is likely coming from somewhere in the atria, okay? All right, so now let's move on to the next portion, and that's ventricular axis, okay? So ventricular axis, the normal ventricular axis lies between negative 30 and positive 110 degrees. All this region here is considered normal axis in our adult patients. We're dealing with a 62-year-old male, so we have an adult here. Next, we have to know that this region here is considered a left axis deviation, while this is right axis deviation, and this is a northwest axis, okay? This being north, this being west, and that's where you get that northwest from, or no man's land, okay, or a rightward superior axis, okay, rightward as it's going to the right, and superior meaning up, okay, so many different names for that region. So what we want to also know here is that we have a few leads that we want to pay attention to. Lead one, which sits here, okay, at zero degrees, that's the positive end of it, and here's AVF, and this is the positive end of AVF at positive 90 degrees. So now what we want to do is find out where this axis lies. Okay, so we have lead one here. We have lead AVF here. These are the positive ends of those leads. And now let's take a look at those leads here. Okay, so if you look here at lead one, all right, and you try to dissect this, you can almost see that above and below is quite similar okay and maybe even a little more negative so if it was positive we would go towards the positive end of lead one if it was negative we'd go toward away from it okay but it's somewhat in the middle so it lies somewhere in between so now let's look at lead avf lead avf is this one and when we look at here we can clearly see that these complexes are above baseline, okay? Mainly this initial portion. So not all of that, because there's somewhat of a T wave there, but most of this here in the beginning, okay? If you look above and below, that's the for, uh, area we're focusing on, okay? Is positive. So positive complexes going towards the positive end of lead AVF puts us right there, okay? So going towards it, all right, and because of that, and we actually have an axis that lies uh, somewhere around this region, okay? Now, another way that you can uh, look at this here is you should know that lead two sits here, lead three sits here, okay? These are the positive ends. Now, if we look at lead two and lead three, which one seems to be more positive, lead two or three? It's actually lead three, okay? So notice lead three more so than lead two, and because of that, we actually know that the axis is going to lie somewhere in this region. Now, the axis that the machine gave us was 101 degrees, okay? So 101 degrees, which is actually a normal axis. But when you're thinking of an adult, uh, that's something to keep in mind that, remember, as we get older, the axis tends to shift more leftward uh, as the left ventricle uh, becomes the dominant portion of the heart. So that's one thing to keep in mind, this axis. While normal, something to keep on the radar. Okay, so 101 degrees would come somewhere in this region here. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's a little difficult uh, ventricular axis to find, more so than some of the others we've seen, but hopefully that makes sense. Now the next thing we want to look at is atrial conduction. So in atrial conduction, one of the things we look at in this point are the P wave abnormalities, okay? And as you recall earlier, we said that we couldn't make out clear P waves, okay? So no clear P waves. And as a result, there is no clear atrial conduction that we can mention um, that would have any atrial enlargement, so right or left atrial enlargement, okay? But there is actual atrial conduction, but when we're looking here, we're kind of looking at any uh, abnormalities in the atria, okay? So no clear ones because we can't make out a P wave, and because there's no P wave, there's no PR segment. So why do I say that? Just to review here, if we have a P wave, our QRS complex, and T wave, Remember that here's the atrial depolarization wave, okay? And then we have our PR segment, okay? And then remember the PR intervals from here to here in this green region. If there's no P wave, then we have no PR segment and we have no um, PR interval, okay? So that's kind of the area we're looking for when I ask about atrial conduction. 
So let's move on to the next one. How about AV conduction, okay? Again, here's where we're looking at that PR interval. We just said that we can't make it out because we have no P waves. So let's move on and skip through this. Next, we talked about IV conduction, and this is intraventricular. Remember earlier, we said that the normal cure duration is less than 120 milliseconds. We mentioned here the QRS duration that the machine gave us was 136 milliseconds, okay? So normal, remember, at 120 milliseconds, once you hit that, is prolonged. And you can think of that equaling three of these small boxes, okay? So from here to here, there's five small boxes, and we're saying three of them. Once you reach that, it's prolonged. So just to illustrate this again, here's our QRS complex, and we're looking at the width of it, the duration from beginning to end, okay? And in this case, we said it was prolonged, so we have a delay in intraventricular conduction, okay? And we'll see a reason of why that's the case. All right, so let's move on here, okay? And next, we have to look at our waveforms, and this is where we would look at PR segment. Now, PR segment, remember, just, just so we're not mistaking, the PR segment is from here to here. We said that there's no P wave, so we don't know, we don't really have an end to a P wave, so we don't have a PR segment, okay? Next, we want to look for abnormal Q waves, okay? Remember the Q waves, if you look at this complex here, know that this is an R wave and this is an S wave. There is actually no Q wave. When we talk about Q waves, we would label them, this here's our P wave, okay? This is a Q wave. This is an R wave, this is an S wave, okay? A Q wave is defined as the first negative deflection preceding an R wave, so coming before an R wave, that is a part of the QRS complex, okay? So no Q wave here, but you can see one here. Now small P waves, or Q waves may be actually normal and um, may be a sign of the, the septum being depolarized in some leads, okay? Especially the lateral leads as it moves from left to right as the left bundle branch actually depolarizes in that direction. However, in some cases, these Q waves can be abnormal, okay? Now there's no significant abnormal Q waves here okay per se yet but i can tell you there's likely some that will be developing but in this case at this point um, no significant q waves uh, that we can make out all right but there are some changes in the st segment now the st segment is this region here at the end of our qrs complex up until the beginning of our t wave so this region here so this represents the end of ventricular depolarization and that start of ventricular repolarization. And this is where we tend to see um, acute changes and when we're looking for ischemia, all right? And as you can see here, there is ST elevation here in lead two especially. So notice this is elevated, okay? Same thing in AVF here. Same thing in lead two, slightly upsloping, okay, there uh, as well. So that's one thing to note. And then you have to notice that we have some um, ST depression, okay? So notice here, we'll use a different color. So we said ST elevation in two, three, AVF. And notice that it is most prominent in lead three, followed by AVF followed by lead two, okay? And that's actually important. That can help you localizing. A little more advanced thing, but notice that it's three greater than AVF, greater than two, okay? If you want to start to localize uh, infarcts, this is something you should try to keep in mind and learn, okay? All right, and next we were talking about ST depression. So elevation when it's above the baseline, depression when it's below. If you look here, here's some S waves here. But then you can see that clearly this region here is depressed, okay? Same thing as we get into here. There's some ST depression there, okay? So some things to note. So ST depression, uh, especially in leads one and AVL. Next, we want to talk about the QTC interval. So what do I mean about the QTC interval? That means from the beginning of a QRS complex, okay, so from this area here, even though that's not a Q wave, that's how we define it, okay, and then all the way to the end. 
So it includes ventricular depolarization, which is this. It includes ventricular repolarization. So that's all the QT interval. Now, when we look at the EKG, we want to use something called the QTC, which corrects for heart rate. And that's because the heart rate can actually affect this interval. This is an important interval uh, to really be aware of because it can determine um, which medications we give okay which ones we avoid whether it's an anti-emetic if someone's nauseous this patient's nauseous so maybe we avoid ondansetron or zofran in this patient or if someone has certain types of antibiotics we may uh, avoid macrolides or, and so forth another thing to be aware of is when it starts to reach near 500 okay these patients are actually increased risk for uh, ventricular arrhythmias you may have heard of torsades de points okay or tdp this is a polymorphic vtec that can actually be fatal so an important area to look at on the EKG. Now the QTC interval that our machine gave us was 414 milliseconds, which is within normal limits, okay? In females, we tend to look at it to be less than 460 milliseconds is normal, and then in males, less than 440 milliseconds, okay? Where you have a male, so obviously we're in the clear here. Now, is there anything else? Well, there is one uh, one more thing that I want to point out here, especially, okay? And that has to do with these findings in our right precordial lead, okay? And our leads here, okay, especially. And that is these almost QR prime. There's some notching there too. Almost RSR prime complexes, um, but clearly something especially here you can see those rabbit ears okay they may ring a bell right now and then these slurred s waves especially okay you can see them here in the lateral leads too slurred s waves but instead these ones are not depressed they're just slurred and that's something i want you to be aware of because that is a right bundle branch block pattern okay now it'd be interesting uh, to compare this to the prior, which we will do, because a functional right bundle branch block with a uh, rhythm like this that I'll tell you shortly may be uh, something called Ashman phenomenon, okay? So we will look at that shortly. All right, now let's look at R wave progression, okay, and the transitional zone. And these last two things that we talk about here have to do with the precordial leads. Again, the lead placement of those chest leads, always an imperfect science, so we always caution you of how much to use them. Now, if you have good uh, text there, which now we're having uh, very good text, and they're, it's almost becoming more of a science, but still not perfect, uh, which is helping. So the precordial leads are these chest leads here, okay, on the EKG. Our standard EKGs that we get have them on the right side and the upper right, and they go from V1, okay, all the way up to V6. And they're going from right to left across the patient's chest. So the R wave progression, and that's the first two, these two things have to do with these leads, is we're looking at the R wave as it increases from going from right to left, okay? Now in the setting of a right bundle branch block, okay, there really, not many people talk about this, but the way I think about it, and I think it's starting to make more sense, is using the initial portion, okay? Especially in the setting of a right bundle branch block, okay, is using the initial portion. So notice that this is small, it's a small Q wave. This initial R wave gets bigger. This one gets bigger, okay? This one, you can see, gets bigger, all right? And then maybe uh, uh, so forth, okay? Or looking at the R to S, okay? So in this case, because it mostly gets bigger, we want it to go from V1 to V5 and increase in amplitude, and maybe not so much in here, but in general it does. We would call this a normal R wave progression, okay? Again, not perfect, um, but something to keep in mind. Now, transitional zone is where we go from mostly uh, negative complexes in these precordial leads to being mostly positive, okay? Again, going from V1 to V6. Now, what we want to do here is, again, we're looking at from being mostly uh, negative to positive, okay? And we're going to look at the initial portion because we don't want to be fooled by this terminal portion that represents that right bundle branch, okay? Again, mostly positive, mostly positive, mostly positive, and then you can see here, I think it's still mostly positive and maybe equal. So maybe V6, we actually have the transition. It's the most isoelectric, okay? 
So normal transition is between V3 and V4, okay? When you have V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6, so if normal's here, if it comes before it, okay, meaning that if it became positive in these leads early on, we would call that, what would we call that? That we call that a early transition, okay? Or we would call that a counterclockwise rotation, as you can see, kind of going backwards. Okay, in this case, it seems to be kind of over in this area, so we call this a late transition or clockwise. Okay, so late or clockwise is what I would go for. Many may argue, but I think uh, the consensus here is certainly that's correct. Okay, um, now I want you to note, you may have noticed that or some may have saw early on is like, why am I not talking about these inverted T waves here in those leads? You have to remember when we have the presence in this pattern of right bundle branch block, discordance, meaning the opposite findings of these are normal in a right bundle branch block, okay? So that's normal findings. Notice here, negative and mostly positive. When you have discordance, those are normal findings. Now, if it were to be the other way where these were actually upright, then I would be a little more alarmed in the setting of a right bundle branch block pattern. But in this case, those are expected changes with a right bundle branch. Now, let's try to take in everything that we've seen here and try to make sense of this all. So we have an irregularly irregular rhythm, okay, likely coming from the atria. Okay, it's a, at a rate of 116 beats per minute. That should clue you into a pattern called AFib with RVR or atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. Okay, an irregularly irregular rhythm. There's only a few that we know out there that are consistently like that. Multifocal atrial tachycardia would be one to differentiate from, but we saw no P waves. Okay, wandering atrial pacemaker is also one, no P waves, and the rate is above 100. So this is AFib with RVR, rapid ventricular response because the rate is over 100 beats per minute. Uh, we said we have somewhat of a rightward shift, but within normal limits of a ventricular axis. Nothing to mention with atrial or AV conduction because we don't see those clear P waves here. IV conduction was delayed, we said, okay? And why is that? Well, that's because it's coming from this complete right bundle branch block. Okay, and what else are we seeing? We are seeing reciprocal changes. We're seeing ST elevation in the inferior leads, mostly in three AVF, okay, more so than two. And then we're seeing some ST depression, okay, and one in AVL, and mostly in AVL, so greater in AVL, as you can see here, more so than in um, here in lead one, okay, that portion there. So, because of that, this is actually a pattern of an inferior ischemia, okay? So this is an, an inferior uh, pattern that you should be aware of, and this is what we call an, uh, likely an acute event, okay? The patient's tired and nauseous. His troponin levels were actually very elevated, which we got, and this was actually an, an inferior MI, okay? So what we would call this here is inferior myocardial injury, okay, or uh, likely developing into an infarct, okay, and this is likely acute. This is an acute pattern because of that elevation and the reciprocal changes and the elevated troponins help to confirm that. Now, eventually, you can start to see these Q waves developing. Remember, this had the greatest ST elevation and they're starting to form uh, those Q waves. Next, you'd likely see them in here in AVF, and then follow suit by in Lee 2. All right. Now it should make sense that we see the most depression in AVL and the most elevation in lead three. And why do I say that? Remember, AVL sits here and lead three sits here. They're pretty much opposite to each other. Okay. So you see the greatest ST elevation in this lead, and you see the greatest ST depression in that lead. Those are what we call reciprocal changes. Okay. So when we compare this to the uh, previous EKG of this patient, there is no uh, evidence of an acute inferior injury, okay? So the patient did have uh, atrial fibrillation. So previous EKG showed atrial fibrillation, but at a normal rate, the rate was actually 70 beats per minute, okay? So no rapid ventricular response. Uh, he did have a prior 
complete right bundle branch block. Okay, and this new inferior myocardial injury, that acute infarct pattern, uh, is new here. Okay, now one thing to note is his axis was similar in the previous, and you can see this rightward shift in the setting of right bundle branch block. Now, earlier I mentioned it's important to know about this right bundle branch block because in the setting of atrial fibrillation, there's a pattern known as Ashman phenomenon that we go into very detail into the, in the book in the course of what this means, okay? And this is a pretty much a functional right bundle branch block that occurs because um, it's pretty much takes longer to repolarize the right side. So you have like a block pattern on the right bundle, but it's actually not a two right bundle branch, okay, block. So that's something that can occur in atrial fibrillation and one thing that we go into much detail, okay? So we have our 62-year-old male presenting to the clinic, just feeling tired, exhausted, nauseous, some vomiting, upset stomach, and he actually has an uh, inferior infarct, okay? So this pattern, or what we see here, is atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, a complete right bundle branch block. That's not new, but this new acute uh, inferior MI, he actually went uh, to cath and had a stent placed in the right coronary artery. Okay, well, that's the end of this week's EKG of the week. I hope you learned something. I look forward to seeing you next time. Now, I want to make you aware of our um, EKG coding reference that many of you are already using, uh, how to get access. Okay, uh, so you want to go to this link here. So put in that link into um, your uh, into the computer, into your internet source, and then go to put your email address here when you get to that and then you're going to use my password here to put in there make sure you're using my password every time okay and let me just erase so, you're not, so, so this one here all lowercase put that in and then click submit confirm your email so check your email get a con confirmation and you'll have access okay and access here will be this and you'll start to see that we have examples and I'm now adding videos into it. So this is an on the go reference has everything you could possibly imagine uh, we use as we're building the course for our fellows here at Mayo Clinic um, and so forth. So I think it's quite handy. Our techs are using it. We're using it for coding uh, here as well. So very helpful way to learn to use as a reference and so forth. OK, and you'll see a lot of the things we discussed in this lecture uh, there as well. All right, so a few things. If you thought, thought this was helpful, if you did, yes or no, I would like to know how I can improve, what kind of topics you want. Please leave them below. Like this video if you find this helpful uh, and share with friends. If you want more practice, okay, obviously more practice, practice is on our Facebook page where there's almost half a million of you there uh, and thank you for your support. We have daily questions trying to get back to you uh, between our clinics and making sure we're staying in touch. So uh, go there for practice. There's daily practice. I leave resources. You can find us on Twitter. Search the EKG guy. YouTube obviously uh, and Facebook. Okay. It's hard to keep up with all these things. So uh, find us there. Share with your friends if you find this helpful. Um, and please leave a comment if there's any topic um, or just kind words. We always appreciate it. And I hope you learned something today. Well, thank you for making us the largest, fastest growing EKG community in the world.